Great. It looks like we're back up and running. So for those that just joined, I just want to say thank you for joining. Um, before we get started, we'd just like to cover some webinar logistics. Um, so for today's agenda, um, we all the webinar will be recorded and a link will be available online on the Babies First Test YouTube channel within 48 hours. If you have any questions, please use the chat box within your GoToWebinar control panel. All questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. If you need IT or technical assistance, please feel free to also use the chat box to communicate and we will get back to you as soon as possible. So for today's agenda, we will start with a quick intro to Baby's First Test for those that are unfamiliar with our work. We'll then hand it off to Dr. Carl White, who will discuss the status and future of newborn hearing screening. Um, and then we'll finally have about a few minutes for a question and answer. So before we begin, Baby's First Test is the nation's resource center for newborn screening information. And we help to inform and support millions of families and healthcare professionals throughout the newborn screening experience. And as we talk about newborn screening, there's often a lot of focus on the blood test or the blood spot screening. But it's important to remember that newborn screening has three parts, including the blood test, hearing screening, and pulse ox. Um, and today we'll be focusing on hearing screening. So how do we inform and support families and healthcare professionals throughout um, the newborn screening process? We do this in a variety of ways. However, one of the primary ways for educating and raising awareness about newborn screening is through our web platform, uh, Babies First Test. We also have our Spanish language site, Spanish.BabiesFirstTest.org. So one of the ways we do this is that we provide information on what to expect living with a condition. We also provide information um, about details on all state programs. So we work with state newborn screening programs to share information about what each state screens for, their policies and procedures. We also share information on all 80 newborn screening conditions, including early signs, treatment, and support services. You can also use our interactive maps for a national picture of what's being screened for. And then finally, we also offer resources for parents and healthcare professionals that you can either download copies of or request free copies. And then finally, we also offer ways for these communities to connect, whether you're a healthcare professional, family, community member, or someone who's just simply interested in newborn screening. Um, we have ways that you can do this through our Ask the Expert tool, our public square forums, as well as through social media. And this is just, if you go to the next slide, this is just an example of one of our condition pages. Um, all of our pages are written to a fifth to eighth grade literacy level. So since Baby's First Test got started in 2011, we've had over 2.6 million visitors, 3.1 million sessions, and over 5 million hits. We wanted to have a better idea of who was actually coming to the site, whether they were finding everything they were looking for. So in 2015, we conducted a user survey to find out who exactly was coming to the site. Through that user survey, we found that approximately half are family members of newborn and the other half are health professionals looking for information. We also have a small slice that are identify themselves as advocates. And through this, we also learned that about 65% reported that they learned something that they didn't know before, and that they're really able to find the information that they were looking for. And by looking at both our site and through the analytics, we realized that while both of our sites are mobile friendly, a majority of the users coming to our site are using their mobile devices. So we, in 2015, we developed a mobile app. Um, the app is available both through Apple Store as well as through Google Play. And for this is for people that are really interested in making sure they have information at the, the touch of their fingertips. You can search for state information. You can search for condition information. You can also save your searches. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we have many different ways to learn, connect, and share, um, in addition to our main content pages. Um, during this time, since we have such limited time here today, I'm only going to focus on the Resource Center today. But if you have any questions at the end of this presentation, you can feel free to email me. 
So through our Newborn Screening Resource Center, um, it's just a one-stop shop for information and resources for newborn screening. Um, and these resources, they're created for expecting parents, the general public, healthcare professionals, parents, policymakers, and more. Um, there's many different types, so you can filter by type or you can search by keyword. You can also use our resource key to find if they were developed by Baby's First Test, by another organization, or by a state program. And if you're interested in adding your educational resource or you're not finding what you're looking for, you can always email resources at babiesfirsttest.org. And finally, we have lots of exciting content and new things coming to Baby's First Test. So in terms of what's coming before September, we have new content. We have information for midwives, information for nurses and nurse practitioners. We also have a family experiences page that will be more interactive for families to interact and view other families or individuals' experiences. Um, and then we often get requests from states or national organizations for families or newborn screening advocates to speak at different events or webinars or to be involved in the steering committee or different work groups. So we will create a list of these families and advocates interested in those different opportunities on the site. And then we also will have new materials, such as education materials for midwives. And in conjunction with New Steps 360, through, uh, which is a program of the Association of Public Health Laboratories, we're also creating an educational toolkit around timeliness that will be available. And then finally, we are working to expand our current services to partners and states and other organizations that may be interested. Um, this includes providing technical assistance around communications and education for newborn screening and also to assist with your strategic planning. So if any of you are interested in that, you can email me. Um, my email address will be available at the end of the presentation. So before we get started with our, um, our presentation from Dr. Carl White, we will just want to do a quick poll to see if um, to see really who's on the line. So I just launched a quick poll, and I'll wait a few minutes as you take it. So I'm going to share the results. Um, I see that a few of you are advocates. We have a mix of healthcare professionals, state employees, and public health professionals, which is great. So great. Um, now I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Carl White. Dr. White is a professor of psychology at Utah State University and the founding director of the National Center for Hearing Assessment and Management, also known as NSHAM. He is nationally and internationally recognized as one of the world's leading authorities on early identification and treatment of hearing loss. He has hundreds of publications and presentations at scholarly meetings and has been an invited speaker to 31 countries where he has assisted in the implementation of newborn hearing screening and intervention programs. He also serves on many national and international advisory groups for organizations. And I'm going to hand it off to you, Carl. Thank you, Jackie. Okay. I'm delighted to be here today. It's a great opportunity to be able to partner with Baby's First Test. Uh, newborn hearing screening is a latecomer in many senses to the newborn screening realm uh, with the first programs being launched in the mid to late 1980s by the time which newborn screening programs were well established. And so it is wonderful to be able to talk with all of you about the status and the future of newborn hearing screening because I think that there's a lot of information out there that will be useful to people and will enable us to run even more efficient programs. Um, let me just check a couple of technical things here. There we go. So many people don't realize that permanent hearing loss occurs more frequently than any other condition we can screen for at birth. If 
if we took a random sample of 10,000 children born in the United States and looked at the congenital birth defects or diseases that we can screen for, then 30 of those children would have hearing loss at birth, would be deaf or hard of hearing, compared to only 11 with Down syndrome or one with phenylcurtinuria or PKU. So congenital hearing loss occurs more frequently than many other conditions with which people are much more familiar. Just to go back a bit in history and give you a context for all of this, this is a picture of Helen Keller, who was both deaf and blind, shown with one of her benefactors, Alexander Graham Bell, and her teacher, Annie Sullivan. Many people know how successful she became in spite of being both deaf and blind. This is some old footage showing how she learned to communicate with other people in spite of being deaf and blind. And it's this ability to communicate that enabled her to be so successful as a social activist, as a speaker, as an advocate for people with disabilities. Later in her life, she was asked whether it was more of a disability to be deaf or blind. And her answer surprised many people. She said that deafness was a far more limiting factor. And the reason she gave is what emphasizes to us how important it is to be engaged in newborn hearing screening programs. She said, blindness separates people from things, but deafness separates people from people. So it's this ability to be able to interact that most of us take for granted that is at the heart of why we are engaged in early identification of children who are deaf or hard of hearing. Children who are deaf or hard of hearing communicate in a variety of different ways. Um, it's not that one way is better than another, but different people choose different ways of communicating, whether it's American Sign Language or signed exact English or cued speech or listening and spoken language. Children who are deaf and hard of hearing, if they're identified early and get appropriate kinds of support, are able to communicate very effectively with others. And as a result of that, are able to be successful in school, have friends in their neighborhood, and actually to do anything that anybody else can do. But for that to happen, it's important that identification happen at a very early age. I'd like to give you a couple of examples of children who are deaf or hard of hearing and how they communicate. This first example is a family of um, two children who are deaf. Uh, both of these little boys were adopted from China when they were about six months old. They came to the United States in a family where the father is deaf and the mother is hearing, but the first language in the home is American Sign Language. Please note how effective these little boys are able to communicate. They're about 15 months old at the time that this video was taken. So they're just leaving a car repair shop. One boy says, the car's up high and it's going higher. Hey, Dad, look over there. I see a car moving up, going higher and higher. Mom, is someone driving that car? There are many cars, and they're shaking. And one little boy starts a side conversation. He says, I love you, Mom. She says, I love you. And he says, I really love you. And his brother says, we'll be there soon. Hey, look over there. Yeah, it's an airplane. I see it, and it's flying. Yeah, an airplane flying. Hey, Dad, pay attention to me. Trains go fast. I'm looking for a propeller. Where is it? Yeah, where is one? Hmm, I don't know. Up in the sky. I don't know. A helicopter. Oh, you're talking about a helicopter. Where's a helicopter? Is it up in the sky? Where? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. There was one here before. Okay, I, I think... Many people don't realize how effective a language, sign language, can be. American Sign Language has its own grammar, its own morphology, but children who learn it early, or anyone who learns it, are able to communicate every bit as effectively as other people can communicate with any other language. Note how these children are able to remember things in the past and talk about that, project to the future, uh, they're having a conversation with each other. They aren't just using manually encoded English to label things. They're having a conversation, is what we 
hope will happen with all children who are deaf or hard of hearing. Now let me give you another example. This is a classroom of children from the mid-1970s, and um, this classroom focused on listening and spoken language. And because technology wasn't as advanced as it is today, we weren't nearly as successful in having children use listening and spoken language then as we are now. So I'm showing you this next little clip to give you a historical perspective from 40 years ago. And then I'll show you a clip from today of what happened. So this little girl has bilateral, uh, severe to profound hearing loss. So she has some hearing and wears a hearing aid. Um, and these little packets you see on front of the children are the hearing aid batteries. So listen to this little girl and see if you can understand what she has to say. <laughs> So most of you, I suspect, didn't understand anything that she said. And this is about the high water mark where we were 40 years ago for children with severe to profound hearing loss who wanted to learn listening and spoken language. I'm going to play it again but give you a visual clue. So with the visual clue, most of you could understand much of what she had to say. This is the situation children were in 40 years ago if they chose listening and spoken language. As their family and those who spent lots of time with them became accustomed to the rhythm and the cadence of their speech, they were able to get most of it. But that's only half of the communication. So they could express themselves so they could be understood, but it was still very difficult for these children to get receptive language and to really participate. So for their family, it's like what you saw on the second slide, but when they went to school or to the neighborhood or to church, it was very difficult for them to communicate successfully. Now let me play you a clip from two little boys who have profound hearing loss. So their hearing losses are more severe than this little girl's. The difference is that they were born in the mid-1990s. They were identified very early, fit with hearing aids, and then sh a short time after received cochlear implants. Listen to them communicate. Voila, that's all there is to it. Now the important thing here is that children, whether they choose American Sign Language or listening spoken language or somewhere in between, that they're learning to communicate, they're developing language, the development of that language will help them to be successful in school and in their neighborhood and to be able to do anything they want to do. What enabled us to move from where we were 40 years ago to where we are today? There are really three interactive phenomena. One is earlier identification of hearing loss through newborn hearing screening programs. And fortunately, as that was happening, better hearing technology was being developed for those families who choose to use that, either hearing aids, cochlear implants, 
FM systems, and those became much more effective and were focused on a pediatric population for the first time. Also, beginning in the mid-1960s and 1970s, we learned a lot about teaching language, whether it's teaching Spanish or French as a second language, or whether it's learning language initially, we learned how to do that much more effectively. And because of that, we're seeing the kinds of results you see here for children, regardless of what the communication modality is that they select. Newborn hearing screening, as I mentioned, started in the mid-1980s. The first large-scale clinical trial was conducted in Rhode Island, and it demonstrated that we could effectively identify children with hearing loss within just the first few weeks of life. The results of that project, together with several other research projects, was used by the National Institutes of Health at a consensus development panel in 1993 to reach the conclusion that all children should be screened for hearing loss uh, before they left the hospital. And because of that, we've seen a dramatic change in the early identification of hearing loss. For those of you who have not seen how simple and effective newborn hearing screening is, I'm going to play a short video next of, of that we developed to educate parents about newborn hearing screening. It shows just how easy this is to do. How can your baby's hearing be checked? Thanks to advances in technology, we can now check a baby's hearing shortly after birth. Your healthcare staff is concerned about your newborn's hearing because one out of every 300 babies is born with a hearing loss. Children who cannot hear clearly will often have trouble learning to communicate. That's why it is important to check or screen each newborn's hearing using one of two safe, simple, and painless procedures. Let's watch an example of each. One method is called OAE, or Otoacoustic Emissions Screening. In this process, a trained screener places a small earphone in the baby's ear that emits a series of soft sounds. The inner ear typically responds to these sounds by producing echoes called otoacoustic emissions, which are analyzed by the screening equipment. Another method is called AABR, or Automated Auditory Brain Stem Response Screening. In this process, a trained screener places Band-Aid-like sensors on the baby's head. As soft sounds are played into the baby's ear, these sensors analyze the brain's response to the sound. No matter which method is used, in a few minutes, the screening is finished and the result is displayed. So as you've, as you've seen in this video, it really is a very simple process that we can train anybody in a hospital setting to do. Most screening is now done by either nurses or nurses assistants, and it just takes a few minutes, as you've seen. As a result of these screening programs, we've gone from screening about 6% of all babies in the early 1990s to where now 98% of all babies are screened before they leave the hospital. And that early screening has resulted in earlier identification. This chart shows the average age at which children with hearing loss were identified back in the mid-1980s to early 1990s, and the average age at which they're identified now. So two to four months of age, babies with hearing loss are identified. Some of those are identified during the first few days of life, but there are still some babies who don't get identified until they're eight to 10 months of age, which is what brings that average up. This little cartoon summarizes where we were in the early 1990s. We'd put a lot of work into developing universal newborn hearing screening programs. And then there was almost an implicit assumption that some miraculous occurrence would happen once the screening was done and we would be successful. But a lot of people recognized that we needed a little more work in this miracle quadrant. And so, we began focusing on the diagnosis, early intervention, medical home, data management, program evaluation, and family support. And for the last 25 years, that's where a lot of the effort has been put, is to make those parts of the process more successful. 
I'd like to talk now about seven different areas where the future work is being done, current and future work. And there's obviously so many different areas I could talk about, so this will just give you a very quick overview of some of the emerging issues to which we need to pay attention. So the first one that gets a lot of attention is loss to follow up from the screening program. Um, this chart shows data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that shows the percentage of children who are lost to follow up or lost to documentation for diagnostic testing and early intervention after they fail the final screen. And so that number has been coming down, but it's still very high. And we need to pay more attention to making sure that all of the children who are screened for hearing loss and who fail that screen receive the follow-up that they need. However, I'd like to suggest for your consideration today that the loss to follow-up calculations, as important as they are, may not be as serious as they appear at first glance. So let me talk just a little bit about how that loss to follow-up number is calculated. So it takes, on the, as the denominator, all of the children who do not pass the final newborn hearing screening. Now, in some screening programs, it's a two-stage process where they'll be screened once before they leave the hospital and then a second time within a week or two after they leave the hospital. The denominator for those programs is the final number of children who do not pass. And then of those children, the numerator is calculated by looking at those the number of children who are contacted but unresponsive, the families, the number that they were unable to contact, and the number who are unknown. So let's look at what happens when you look at these numbers a little closer. You won't be able to read this, and that's okay. This is the report that the Centers for Disease Control pr produces each year from which that graph was developed. So in that, for every state, there's a total number of babies who did not pass. There's also the total number of babies in each of those three categories, contacted but unresponsive, unable to contact, and unknown. Those two numbers are used to first calculate the 52,961 children who did not pass, and then to put that in the denominator, and the numerator is the number of children in those other three categories, contacted but unresponsive, unable to contact, and unknown. So for this particular year, 2014, the number was 35.9%. But what happens if we take out those children in the category parents contacted but unresponsive? Then that number drops from 35.9% to 17.8%. Why might we want to take those children out? Well, in that particular year, there were 9,000 children whose parents were contacted. The newborn hearing screening program talked to the parents or had some sort of communication with the parents through email or text messages or phone calls or in some cases person-to-person -person visits, and the parents elected not to come back for another screen. In many cases, it was because the children were developing language nicely and the parents weren't concerned about their hearing loss. So those children are not really lost to follow up because the newborn hearing screening program knows exactly where they are and in fact has communicated with them. So one of the things that many people are suggesting now is that we may want to look at loss to follow up slash documentation in a more nuanced way. Let me give you another example. You, this is one that is surprising to a lot of people, but if you base that denominator on the final screen, it doesn't enable you to account for children who failed the screen in the hospital but passed before they came, uh, when they came back for that secondary screen at two to four weeks. In the states where we were able to calculate it, we recently published a paper showing that uh, if you base the denominator on the screen at hospital discharge, then in, in these six states, instead of a weighted average loss to follow up of 57.4%, it drops down to 17.2%. And that's because in these states, they were very successful at finding those babies who didn't pass the initial screen 
got them to come back, and they passed the second screen. So again, it's a much smaller percentage of babies being lost to follow-up than you might think at first glance. Finally, what happens if you calculate the loss to follow-up based on the total birthing population? In other words, what percentage of the birthing population uh, fails a screen and is lost to follow-up? When you base it on that total population, then less than or about one half of 1% of babies are lost to follow-up, which means we're doing very well indeed. Now, I'm not suggesting which one of these is the best measure of loss to follow-up. I'm just saying that loss to follow-up is a much more complicated metric than we sometimes assume than it is. So you can see in the red numbers in the middle, that's the loss to follow-up based on the current method. The ones in the blue are those if you don't count those parents who are contacted but unresponsive. And the ones in the green is as a percentage of the total population. Let me raise another issue. We're doing a pretty good job of screening all newborns for hearing loss, but what about children who develop hearing loss after the newborn period? We know from data collected by the, uh, by the Centers for Disease Control through the uh, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey that about twice as many children become deaf or hard of hearing in the one to five year old period as are born deaf or hard of hearing. So it's very important to be able to identify those children. We've been working on a project now since the mid, since the early 2000s in which we work with Head Start programs to screen children. We started off with 69 programs in three states we were able to demonstrate that you can identify about two children per thousand with permanent hearing loss, which is almost as many as we identified during that newborn hearing period, um, plus another 20 per thousand with unidentified transient losses that need assistance as well. So doing screening in early childhood programs is a very important area that we need to pay more attention to. This has been very successful in Head Start programs, but Head Start only serves about a million children a year. And so it's serving less than 10% of all children. So children in IDEA programs, children in daycare programs, children in other sorts of preschool programs, we aren't doing as good a job yet with screening those children as we need to do, especially when you keep in mind that there are twice as many children who develop hearing loss during that period as are born with hearing loss. Another area where we try to screen children is in their visits to uh, physicians' offices for their well baby care. We did a survey several years ago in which we asked physicians how often they did screening. So about 30% of them said that they were systematically doing hearing screening uh, during those well child visits. So we have a long ways to go, but just as importantly, even those who are doing screening, if we look at how they're doing hearing screening, they aren't using the methods that are most effective. So many of them are still relying on noisemakers or caregiver interviews or questionnaires. Um, what the ideal would be is for them to be using autoacoustic emissions or OAE. You can see on this chart only about 50% of those who do screening and that's only 30% of the population, are using autoacoustic emissions. Higher percentages are still relying on methods that are not nearly as effective. This chart shows a roadmap that we worked with the American Academy of Pediatrics to develop. I know you can't read it. I'm going to highlight part of it that's the most important right here. But this has been distributed to all members of the American Academy of Pediatrics and many people in the American Academy of Family Physicians as well. One aspect of it is that it recommends that for all children with hearing loss that they be referred to an ophthalmologist and to a geneticist to collect additional information. So in 2006 and again in 2012 we did national surveys of physicians and ask them how often 
those recommendations were followed. It was in an open-ended question where we said, assume a newborn for whom you are caring is diagnosed with moderate to profound hearing loss. If no other indications are present, to which specialist would you refer the baby? And so it was open-ended, so there were no hints. Less than 1% said that they would refer babies for an ophthalmological evaluation. Um, only about 9% said they would refer for a genetic evaluation. 75% said they would refer for an otolaryngological evaluation. That sounds good compared to the others, but still is alarming that 25% would not refer to an ENT. So we have a long ways to go in terms of educating physicians. We also asked them when a baby could be fit with hearing aids, and it's alarming that about 50% of them didn't realize you could fit a baby with hearing aids until the baby was six months old or older. They, they did not realize that you can fit babies with hearing aids at just a few weeks of life. And in fact, that's the most effective time if the family chooses hearing aids that they should be being fit. Let me turn to another area now, and that's delivering early intervention services to families. There has been a lot of work in the last five years focusing on using two-way video conferencing to do what we call tele-intervention to provide services to families since many children who are deaf or hard of hearing live in areas where it's difficult to get services because of the specialized nature of those services. I'm going to play you a little video of this little boy when he was just a baby receiving uh, tele-intervention services. You'll see his mother and him in, in a room in their home, and then a speech-language pathologist uh, in a remote setting working with this family. Hi. Hi, Alex. Hi. Looking up. Um, so why don't you just present the sound, Nancy, and then um, we'll see if he you know, has any reaction uh, just to your voice. No, no toy. Just, yeah, just, you just want to present the sound first, and then we'll see if he, if he looks and starts turning to you or anything like that. Perfect. Awesome. He looked right at you. Awesome. Yeah, so he looked up, so you can keep it the reward. Okay, this slide shows the results of a randomized experiment we did with children who uh, were either randomly assigned to be in a face-to-face -face early intervention group or a tele-intervention intervention group. And as you can see here, children in the tele-intervention group actually did better than children in the face-to-face -face group. So this is becoming a much more widespread, it still has a ways to go, but many more people are exploring now the use of tele-intervention as a method of getting services to children who are identified through newborn hearing screening programs. Our website at infanthearing.org contains a uh, resource guide that uh, includes training videos, um, license agreements, other things that a learning community that is focusing on tele-intervention contributes as a way of assisting others in developing those programs. A fifth area is that we need to remind ourselves of the population being served by EDI programs. This graph shows the percentage of children reported to the Centers for Disease Control um, in each of the various areas. And notably, almost 40% of the children being identified are children with unilateral losses. Uh, another 14% with bilateral mild losses and another 18% with bilateral moderate losses. So the assumption of many people is when we talk about children in newborn hearing screening programs, that the majority of those are children with bilateral severe to profound losses like the children whose videos you saw earlier in this presentation. But in fact, the majority of children are children with much more mild hearing losses, even though it's very important to identify 
and assist those children as early as possible. If you don't identify children with unilateral losses, they will fall behind substantially in reading and math skills. They won't be as accomplished in terms of their social interactions. So it is important to identify them very early. It's also important to note that the vast majority of these children have hearing parents. So only about 5% of children are born in families where both parents are deaf or hard of hearing. So that affects how we deliver services to children. We're also seeing a shift in children and in, in, in the communication modality that children's families are choosing for them. So this is data from a report we finished last year that did a national survey of families. About 66% of those families are choosing listening and spoken language as their primary method of communication. Only about 6% are choosing some form of sign language as their primary form of communication. Now, families ought to be able to choose whatever communication mo modality they want, and they should get the support and assistance that they need to be successful in that. And families need to know that it, even if they pick listening and spoken language to start with and want to shift to sign language later on, that's perfectly all right. And they need to get the support that they need. And in fact, we found in this study that most families did change to some degree how they communicated with their families all over that first six years of life. A similar survey was done by the recently funded Family Leadership and Language and Learning Center that's uh, based with the Hands and Voices program in Colorado. And then they found similarly that the majority of families are using English as their primary mode of communication. Um, the snapshot study that I referred to a moment ago includes a lot of other information that should guide us in terms of how we design and deliver services to, to children. So snapshot stands for systematic nationwide analysis of program strengths, hurdles, opportunities, and trends. And it included uh, surveys of families, of audiologists, of early intervention providers. One of the notable findings in the report was that almost 20% of families felt that there was a large or even an unbearable financial burden associated with providing support to their child who was deaf or hard of hearing. So in an era of free public education and the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, where we assume that all of these families are getting the services they need through the public education programs, uh, this data shows that a significant number of families are not getting what they need. There are a number of federally funded groups that provide family support, and we ask families how aware they were of those programs. And the kind of yellow color on the left-hand side shows that a large percentage of those families are not very aware of what these resources are. So part of the problem in families getting what they need is making sure that they know what's available now. And we still have a lot of work to do in that area. We find that almost a third of the families reported that they were arranging for supplemental private early intervention services because they didn't feel like their child who was deaf or hard of hearing was getting what he or she needed through the publicly available programs. Almost two thirds of audiologists reported that they had requests from parents seeking supplemental early intervention services. And we found that very few of the personal preparation programs for teachers of the deaf provide coursework or practical experience focused on early intervention or early childhood education. We also asked families what kinds of services they needed and were able to get or what sorts of services they needed and had problems getting. And you see that there's almost half of that sample wanted to have more opportunities to interact with adults who are deaf or hard of hearing. 22% of them said that they got what they wanted, but 23% said they wanted it but couldn't get it. Similarly, an even higher percentage said that they wanted to be able to meet with families of children who are deaf or hard of hearing. 
and about half of that group was unable to get those kinds of services. Going down further, you see that most of the families were able to get things like speech language therapy, assistive hearing devices, family training. Um, but this does point out some areas where we need to do some additional work. Seventh area I want to talk about very briefly is cytomegalovirus, um, or CMV. Cytomegalovirus is a very frequent virus in the population. Almost all adults have been exposed to it. It causes almost no problems for the vast majority of people, something akin to a mild cold. But if you contract cytomegalovirus during pregnancy, then about 20% of the babies of mothers who contracted during pregnancy will be born with uh, congenital cytomegalovirus. And for uh, some of those children, um, so about a little less than 1% of all babies are born with congenital cytomegalovirus each year, about 0.75%. So it's about 30,000 babies. And of those babies, uh, a fairly large percentage will be deaf or hard of hearing. Another significant group will have serious intellectual disabilities. Some will be born with cerebral palsy. A, a few babies will die. Uh, this is a very important condition that we need to pay more attention to. Interestingly, uh, this data comes from a survey done each year by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and if you look at the awareness of a condition versus the incidence of a, a, the condition, it's very interesting. So only 6.7% of the population surveyed had ever heard of congenital cytomegalovirus, but it affects 6,000 children a year. You compare that to um, children born with HIV AIDS, 86% of the population was aware of congenital HIV AIDS. That only affects 30 children per year. So we've got a disproportionate awareness to incidents, and, and we need to do a better job of making people aware of it. A 2007 study found that only a fewer than half of OBGYNs discussed cytomegalovirus with their patients. Um, and so this is one of the first areas where we need to be putting more attention is to make sure that people who are pregnant or becoming pregnant are aware of cytomegalovirus. The good news is that the incidence of congenital cytomegalovirus can be reduced dramatically by using good hygiene. So by washing hands frequently, especially after changing diapers or wiping noises, not sharing food with toddlers, kissing babies on the forehead instead of the, the lips and wiping down toys and surfaces, we can dramatically reduce the incidence of congenital cytomegalovirus. There is not yet a vaccine for it, um, and there are treatments that are still off-label. FDA has not yet approved treatments. So there's a lot of work to be done, but one of the things is to help people to become more aware of the importance of detecting cytomegalovirus and preventing it. So my last slide, this is our website, www.infanthearing.org, contains information on all of these things I've talked about only very briefly. Um, we are excited to be partnering with Baby's First Test because it's clear that congenital hearing loss, if it's undetected, cause serious problems for children. But we have methods that effectively and inexpensively can detect it, and we can clearly help these children to become anything they want to be if we provide appropriate early intervention and appropriate family support during those first few weeks, months, and years of life. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this information for you, and I think we still have a few minutes for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. White. That was a really great presentation. I think it gave a really great overview of kind of where we are and where the future holds. Um, we do have some time for questions. Um, and I believe we already have some questions in. One of the questions had 
been about sending guidelines to them, um, to the attendees, which I believe the guidelines they were referring to is maybe AAPs. I can work with Dr. White on getting some of those guidelines and then we'll include it in your follow-up email. And then I have two additional questions for you, Dr. White. One is, one are, what are the best ways to improve the newborn screening long-term follow-up rate? And I'm assuming that's around hearing. Yeah. The states that have been most successful in um, reducing or keeping the level of loss of follow-up very low are those states who have been able to devote resources uh, to follow-up coordinators so that have an effective system for reporting the information to the uh, state-based EDI program and then there's someone at the state who has time to follow up with those families and to assist them in getting in for the next test. Some of the states that have done that most effectively have been able to pair that with family engagement. So there's some programs they go by different names, but one of the most popular names is called Guide by Your Side. And so there's actually someone who has a child who is deaf or hard of hearing who works for the state EDI program who then contacts that family when they don't pass their newborn hearing screening test and helps them to make arrangements for the next step. And um, that seems to be a very effective strategy but it takes a little bit of money to be able to hire those people and to support them at the State Eddy program. Great. I have another question that says, any data on the percent of infant and toddlers in early intervention programs that have had their hearing assessed? There are not good data on the percentage of children in, in, in infant and toddler programs. There are several studies that have demonstrated that when you go in and systematically screen those children, that you find a relatively high incidence of children with hearing loss. One of the problems is that the techniques used to screen babies in those infant and toddler programs are sometimes not the best practices. And so they rely on parent report or on um, behavioral measures, noise makers, et cetera. In those cases where there have been targeted research studies that have used autoacoustic emissions or pure tone audiometry to screen children in those programs, then we find a much higher percentage of children. Uh, there are resources available on our website as well as some other places, but if you go to um, kidshearing.org, uh, there's um, step-by-step -step resources that can help people to do that screening effectively. Wonderful. We have a question um, regarding the, the CDC. It says, why, does, why would the CDC consider parents who respond but don't come in be considered unresponsive? Looks like we need better data. Uh, you know, when the CDC developed those initial loss to follow-up formula, um, they were working on, in, uh, in a brand new area. And I, I think using that final number of children who don't pass the, the final test is a reasonable way. Um, but over the last couple of years, as this data has become clear, the CDC is now beginning to revise those guidelines. Uh, during this last reporting year, which was 2015, CDC provided states with the option of including parents who were contacted but unresponsive or not including those parents. So they want to be able to uh, compare the results going forward with results in the past, but they've also provided kind of a two-track system so states can report it in both ways now. So I, I think those things are evolving, and as we get more information, um, then the CDC has been very good about uh, helping to refine and adjust those reporting tools. Great, thank you. We have one last question, it appears. It says, when should a premature infant be tested based on chronological age or corrected age? Um, 
So a premature infant will sometimes have other medical conditions which are more important than detecting hearing loss. And so it's not a matter of using corrected or chronological age. It's a matter of testing the baby as soon as it's possible after the baby can, becomes medically stable. So if the baby's born four weeks premature and is medically stable, they should be tested immediately. So the, the auditory system is fully developed when the baby is born, even if they're premature. But if there are other medical issues that are so serious that um, they may take precedence over hearing testing until the baby becomes medically stable. Wonderful. And it looks like a couple more questions came in. Can breastfeeding transmit CMV? Yes. And, and that's why it's important to know whether the baby had congenital CMV or not. And to do that, you, you need to do the testing for congenital CMV before the baby is three weeks old. Great. Do you have any updates on the new JCIH guidelines? Uh, I am not a member of JCIH. I do talk to my friends who are members of JCIH. They are very close to releasing the updated guidelines. Um, I know that it's been submitted to uh, a journal for publication. The committee has pretty well finished their work. They're just now working with some questions and clarifications from the editor of that journal. I would expect it would be out within the next couple of months, but it's a little hard to predict. Great. I have a question that says, is there a way to compare the, and I'm, the long-term follow-up LTF percentage with a state that has a program life guide by your side and a one that doesn't? Is there a significant gap in the success rate? You can compare states that have those programs and those that don't. The problem is there are so many other concomitant variables that might affect loss to follow up as well that it makes it difficult to draw any definitive conclusions. I think the evidence is pretty clear that states who have the wherewithal to devote resources to loss to follow up coordinators and have that kind of parent to parent interaction uh, do very well. Um, but there are other states who have other programs in place um, that also do well. So a definitive comparison is really not possible. Great, thank you. We did have more of a comment, more than a question, but it was talking about the breastfeeding to around CMV which just said an important clarification that breastfeeding is not dangerous. Healthy infants and children who acquire CMV after birth generally have few, if any, symptoms or complications from the infection. Um, and if I didn't make, yeah, if I didn't make that clear, that clarification is 100% on target, okay? Um, so congenital CMV is what causes the uh, negative sequelae. If, if you go to a group of 50 preschool children, um, half of them will have active CMV infections at any point in time. And like I say, the symptoms are like a very mild cold. Um, and so those children are not dangerous to themselves. Um, they could be dangerous to a worker in that preschool program where appropriate hygiene measures are not being taken. That's why we say uh, if we practice those good hygiene measures of not sharing food, not kissing babies on the lips, washing your hands frequently, then that will dramatically reduce the infection rate of CMV for mothers or mothers-to-be. And that is where the problem happens when we have congenital CMV. Great, thank you for that clarification. 
So it looks like we don't have any more questions coming through. I did have one for you myself, Dr. White. Um, and I know you touched on this briefly throughout your slides, but I was wondering what do you see as the major educational gap for parents around newborn hearing screening? I know we talked a lot about CMB and ra raising awareness, and I think you touched on um, knowing what's available, parents needing to know what's available. Is there any other, I would say, pain points that we should be focusing on around education for parents around newborn hearing screening? I think the most important thing is for parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts to realize that the importance of quick follow-up when hearing, when there's reason to suspect that there may be a hearing loss. So we don't want to unnecessarily alarm parents when their baby doesn't pass that screening test in the hospital. but we do want them to understand the urgency of getting back quickly to do the next step in the process. And it's unfortunate that um, many parents will be told by their Aunt Sally or by even their pediatrician who isn't up to speed that, well, a lot of babies don't pass that screening in the hospital and they turn out to be just fine. And so then the parent delays coming back for that follow-up testing. Um, the follow-up testing is inexpensive, it's easy, it's not painful, and it's important to come back as quickly as possible because if the baby does have a hearing loss, then that's going to interfere with language development and that will interfere with social development and intellectual development. And so raising the urgency of doing follow-up testing without alarming parents, I think, is the key. Thank you. That's really wonderful. And I've received many comments thanking you for your wonderful talk. Um, thank you, Dr. White. This was really wonderful. We've learned a lot, and I know that many on the line have learned a lot. Um, just for anyone who's still on the line, these um, we will send out a follow-up email to all those who registered and attended. We will also send you the link to our YouTube channel, which we will post this webinar um, through. Um, and if you have any other questions, you can email me or Dr. White. Um, and I'm also able to direct any more questions to Dr. White as they come through. So thank you, everyone, for joining. We really appreciate your time. Um, and again, thank you, Dr. White, for your wonderful presentation. Thanks for the opportunity to collaborate with uh, Baby's First Test. We are looking forward to further collaboration. Us too. All right. Thank you so much.